Good morning, Professor. Ah, uh, the great one. How are you, Mr. Oakley? Couldn't hear you on that one, buddy. I think you might have been muted. Thank you in advance. Thank you in advance for doing this. My pleasure. Joe, you're not you're not in your office. I am in a office. <laughs> <laughs> I just look across the suite and you're not there. I'm in a man cave. All right, Joe, are you ready to get started? Uh, yes, ma'am. All righty. Well, thank you, everybody, for being with us this morning. Um, we are excited to have you and, and looking forward to what is sure to be a very educational um, session here with Joe. Um, I'm sure many of you know him, but um, he is a professor in the P PGM program at um, Florida Gulf State University um, and was also a director of golf for um, 24 years at the Glades Golf and Country Club. So backgrounds in accounting and finance as well as, um, you know, green grass golf facility side. So we're lucky to have him here presenting to us. Um, before we get started, um, I just wanted to remind you all um, to stay on mute throughout the call, just in case um, there's any uh, background noise, it'll be distracting um, if you're not on mute. So make sure to stay on mute um, throughout the call. Um, if you have any questions during the session, please feel free to put them in the chat feature um, and we'll be sure to answer them. Uh, we'll most likely save all questions till the end, but um, Joe will be happy to answer any questions at the end once he gets through his presentation. Um, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Joe. Great. Thank you, Jackie. I appreciate that. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, if I can, I would just like to do a brief uh, survey of the room in terms of, um, obviously, your name, uh, what your uh, position is in the club that you work at or for. So I can try to kind of gauge, you know, are we talking about do we have a lot of GMs, a lot of HPs, director of golfs or, or assistants? And I'm going to try to maybe fine tune that to kind of your your position. So um, I'm just going to call on you if you wouldn't mind just giving a shout out. And the first tile I have here is uh, Mr. Oakley. So you want to uh, give a shout out there, sir? Absolutely. Uh, my name is Matt Oakley. I got professional and director of golf at Worthington Country Club in Bonita Springs, Florida. Uh, you came up on my list after that. Uh, I'm sorry, Janet. <laughs> we already got Jackie. Janet. Sorry about that. Uh, Janet Kernan at Florida Gulf Coast University, and I am the operations coordinator. So um, my background for this uh, position is, is the budgeting and implementing of payouts and payments and re their receivings of, of revenues and expenses for the department. Uh, Brett? Yeah, sure. My name is Brett Graham. I'm the president of Easy Picker Golf Products. Uh, Brian. Hey, Joe, it's Justin. Uh, Lafont. Brian, Brian's uh, next door. He's multitasking, ringing in a, uh, a guest. Uh, at the okay, moment. so you tie cheat me on that one, huh? <laughs> All right, Daryl.
Oh, there we go. Morning, Joe. Uh, Daryl Bach here. I'm the uh, director of operations here at First Key Palm Beaches. Um, so that's my background and looking forward to a great program. All right. Uh, we have Jordan. <coughs> Yeah, my name is Jordan Liddy. I am the head golf professional at Sand Hill Crane Golf Club in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, and newly elected member. And this is my first educational um, experience. So glad to join everybody. And I hope I don't scare you off. Um, <laughs> Joseph? Hi, I'm Joe Pompatello. I'm the head golf professional at Indian Creek Country Club in Miami, Florida. Uh, thanks for thanks for doing this. You're welcome, uh, Kathy. All right, Kathy. Oh, hi. Okay, sorry, I couldn't figure it out. Okay, <laughs> hi, Kathy Cassessi. I'm the head pro at um, Island Dunes Country Club in Jensen Beach, Florida. Martha. Marty Hall, um, assistant director of the PGA Golf Management Program. Um, Michael. Oh, Michael, I, we have a couple of them. Yeah, sorry about that. I'm the head golf professional here at Piper's Landing in Palm City. Excellent, thank you. Uh, the other Mike. Mike, you out there? Going once, going twice. All right, we'll move on. Uh, Nate? Yeah, Nate Tyler. I'm the head golf professional at Coil Valley Golf Club up in Vero Beach. Uh, Sarah? Hey, good morning. Uh, Sarah Dixon, director of golf at Wilderness in Naples. And I enjoy uh, the budget process and all things financially related. So thanks for doing this. Cool. You're a geek like me. Scott. Scott Cash, head golf professional at the Nest Golf Club in uh, Bonita Springs, Florida. And I just have a, a last name for this one. It's uh, Tremonsky. I think that's Tony Romanski on there. Oh, well. <laughs> Tony Romanski. <laughs> it just says Tronsky. <laughs> Using a secret username. You there, Tony? I know he's the sales rep with Taylor Maine. Oh, okay. Um, and we have William. Yes, good morning, Joe. Thanks for uh, for doing this. It's great. Um, numbers geek like you and uh, an independent contract oh. teach excellent excellent um did i miss anybody anybody jump in that i might have missed all right well let's get started what do you say all right let's get into this so let me just tell you a quick story um when i started working at the university uh, and I, since I have a degree in accounting, they, they had a shortage of uh, accounting teachers in the School of Hospitality, so they asked if I would fill in. I was like, well, I haven't done accounting for a while, but yeah, sure, I love it. And so one of the things I did, I joined the American Accounting Association, which is the largest accounting group, uh, even bigger than the AICPA, went to one of their education seminars in New York City and wanted to see if there was a lot of changes. Well, you know what I found out? Debits are still on the left and credits are still on the right. So boy, was that disappointing. No, accounting hadn't changed, you know, there's still things. I mean, there were a few little updates and all that stuff. So I thought, boy, I don't have to like relearn accounting again. That's good. So I took the opportunity to go into some of the breakout sessions for 
things like uh, data analytics and Power BI and big data and all this stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been around a while. I've seen a bunch. I was blown away. I mean, I was completely blown away at the level of sophistication of what's going on out there in what I call the, the real world, the business world. Um, it, it included things that uh, and terminologies that I was not familiar with. And I was in shock. And I, I was just thinking to myself, when I reflected about our industry and how I conducted, and I was included in this, is that we were like cavemen hunting with spears and arrows, <laughs> trying to just, you know, kill a wildebeest or something. We're, we were so far behind in uh, our understanding of what's going on with all of these new uh, uh, information systems, data analytics, um, that uh, I, I just had to learn more about it. And it became kind of my, and I won't say mission, that's too strong of a word. Let's use advocation to really try to bring some more sophisticated uh, processes, procedures, insights to what it is that we do in order to elevate our profession and to get better results for ourselves as professionals and for our industry and our clubs. So. I, I just want to kind of give you that background context of, of where we're going. This particular uh, session is going to be uh, kind of elementary, very simple. I'm sure many of you have heard a lot of these concepts before. Some of you, it may be that you might be introduced to it. I'm going to go very, very quickly. I'm not going to get into the weeds or get into how to do these things. Um, Jackie's going to be sending you some links that have videos on how you can actually set up in Excel all of the things that we're going to talk about here today. And it's step by step, monkey see, monkey do stuff. Just very simple on how you can construct these things. So what I'm going to ask you to do today is kind of just sit back, keep an open mind, see if there's some things in there that you may be able to take and use in your club. I'll be trying to give some concrete examples of, of how these things are used. But we're going to take some managerial uh, accounting constructs, the first one being what we call CVP, uh, variation analysis, capital budgeting, and the time value of money, and time permitting, we'll get into forecasting. So sound like a plan? Good. We'll go with it. Um, so after I was kind of, like I said, shocked and awed, which is the right words, in this American Accounting Association meeting, one of the things that I tried to pursue was uh, some more things uh, related to business analytics. Uh, I uh, got uh, into uh, Six Sigma and uh, got some certifications in that. And even there's a thing called Power BI, which is a wonderful way for you to do uh, dashboards while dealing with large data sets. Um, but today's applications are gonna be more, uh, I would say, germane to our jobs. So let me pull up my first screen here and see if we can get this going. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, uh, the reason that we're doing this today is to more to just uh, open your mind to possibilities of some new applications that you might be able to do, deeper understandings and better ways of maybe managing and doing things through data insights. So let's jump right into our first category here. And we talked about, uh, we're going to do uh, some, what they call cost volume profit analysis. Now, a lot of you are used to dealing with budgets and you're gonna find that uh, you're gonna look at this and go like, oh, well, this is kind of like a budget, maybe on steroids. And yeah, that's about all it is. But the nice thing about it is gonna be dynamic in nature. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The next thing we're gonna deal with is what is called budget variation analysis. Now we all live and die by our budgets, I hope. And uh, what we're gonna do with this is get a little bit deeper understanding of how we can analyze our budget variations, um, especially in the areas of variable costs. 
And again, we'll talk more about that later. Then we're going to pivot and talk about capital budgeting decisions. Okay, how do I decide how to spend my capital money? And we're going to talk about the difference between capital money and revenue expenses, capital expenses versus revenue expenses. But how do I make decisions between competing needs in a, in a company when I have limited resources? And then, as I mentioned before, time permitting, we might talk about some forecast modeling, which can be very helpful. If you can predict the future, you might have a future job. So um, let's talk about, so what is this CVP I keep talking about analysis? Well, it has to do with cost, volume, profit, all right? And it really deals with determining and seeing what is the impact of these variables, cost, volume, and profit, and how they interplay with each other. And it enables managers to kind of explore the relationship among costs, sales volumes, and profit in a, in a dynamic way. So this CVP analysis is not only an equation, but it can be expressed graphically as well. And that's where you get the dynamic aspects of it. And I'm gonna be showing you how to do that as well. Now for us old timers out there, we may be used to hearing something called break-even analysis, which is really um, a derivation of CVP. Uh, break-even analysis is really just a point in time where the cost, volume, profit analysis is more dynamic in nature. It's, it's constantly moving. Um, so um, what we're going to be showing is how this relationship between fixed costs, variable costs, and revenues, how they interact with each other. And as I mentioned, they can be represented either mathematically or graphically. So here's a, an example of a basic uh, equation for cost volume profit. And it's real simple. You can see it's our income equals our selling price times the number of units sold minus our variable cost times the number of units sold minus our fixed cost. So it's a pretty basic formula. So again, our sales minus our variable cost minus our fixed cost. That's basically it. But that one equation can actually be manipulated in a number of different ways. So we can find out a lot of insights about well, what is our break-even point? What's the number of units sold, whether it's rounds or whether it be shirts or whatever Joe, it is? Yes. Um, unfortunately, we don't see anything on the screen for us. We only see you and and you speaking. We don't see anything of diagrams or anything. Well, that's a problem. Well, how long has that been going on? <laughs> oh, since you started talking. Okay, well, that's a problem. Let's try that again. Um, I thought it was just a me problem. Can we see this? Can we see this? No. No. We just see your your beautiful face. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, Jackie. Yes. Are you here? Here. It says uh, uh, I can't. Do you, do you have to give me permission? Um, I think you should have it because we had it up before. Yeah, we had it up a minute ago. Do you have that arrow at the bottom there? Present now. Uh. Do, 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 do. No, I have, well, I have stopped sharing. Let me try it again. Huh. All right, let me try. Try one more time. Okay, it's not allowing me to, okay, here we go. Let's try down here, entire screen. Are we seeing this at all? Yes, coming up now. Oh, it did pop up. Is it, it's We're getting up. close. Oh, 
Okay, that's there you good. go. Awesome. Okay, I just had to restart it, I guess. I'm awfully sorry about that. Just yell at me next time. <laughs> I'll feel right at home. Okay, here we go. So I'm going to just skip over what I just uh, what, uh, talked about. These are the things that we're going to cover. Uh, talked about what the CVP is, so that's all good. So that wasn't anything interesting. Here's that equation that I was just talking about. That would probably be noteworthy. And can you see the highlighter here too, by the way, that I have? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Sorry about that. So as I mentioned earlier, the equation is income equals sales price times volume minus our variable cost times the volume minus the fixed cost. Or simply stated, it's income equals sales minus variable cost minus fixed cost. So that's, that's nothing too exciting. So I think this is where we kind of left off. So basically, we can determine the units sold in order to break even. So what's the number of rounds? What's the number of shirts? What's the number of uh, meals that we have to serve? Whatever part of the operation you're dealing with to determine a break even. We can determine the amount of fixed cost that is necessary to reach a break even point. We can determine the selling price that we need to break even. And then we can determine the variable cost per unit in order to break even. So from that one equation, we can derive a lot of information. Um, to do this mathematically is one thing. To do it in a dynamic model is another thing. So let's take a look at what that would look like in order to uh, turn that into a model that's dynamic. So let's hope this one works. This takes a minute for it to load, I noticed, uh, on here, but it should come up. And we're just going to, y'all getting this um, on your screens? Yes. Okay. So here's an example of how you can actually use this, these concepts of break even and cost volume profit analysis. So let's just do a little scenario here. So let's say you manage a course, you want to analyze the financial performance for an upcoming year or season or whatever. You want to understand how changes in the number of rounds played, your volume, and the associated costs will impact your profits. So your golf operation primarily generates revenues from greens fees, cart fees, and pro shop sales. So let's take a look at how we can determine what our break-even point is and what our profit and uh, profits will be at various volumes. So if we take a look at this here. Um, we can see that we have uh, greens fees, cart fees, pro shop sales on a per round basis, totaling a variable revenue of $80 per round. Then we have some uh, variable costs that includes the cost for the greens fees is be like utilities, maintenance, personnel for each round, a variable cost for cart rentals, a variable cost for pro shop sales, um, totaling $20 of variable cost. And then fixed costs, uh, which would be like our overall golf course maintenance, employee salaries, uh, marketing, et cetera, et cetera. And again, this is just very simple. I'm just trying to give you the concepts here. You can make this as elaborate or as uh, simple as you want for your operation. Um, one of the things that we have in our industry, notice that we have selling price, variable costs, and fixed costs. There's another type of variable cost sometimes called semi-variable or mixed cost. And there's those things that aren't directly variable costs, like, for example, cost of sales or the uh, revenues per round is very directly variable. For every round, we get an extra cart fee or whatever. But some costs are mixed. And I'm not going to deal with that today. I'm just trying to give you the concept of how you can use this dynamic model um, in uh, just in meetings with your uh, general manager or in your uh, golf committee meetings or uh, board meetings. But if we have these variable costs and fixed costs identified, then we can do the analysis. So as we mentioned, total revenues, $80 per round, uh, variable cost, $20 per round. That gives us a contribution margin, which is my variable cost minus my uh, or my variable revenues minus my variable cost equals my contribution margin. Uh, that allows us to be able to determine our break-even point from the formula that I mentioned above. 
So if we take our total fixed costs divided by our contribution margin, we see that the break even for this club is 34,000 rounds. If we want to find out what the profit analysis is, we want to say, okay, so let's assume that we have 40,000 rounds. We're going to sell or have 40,000 rounds. What does that mean? Well, if we go through the formula and do the application of the formula, we see that we make $340,000 based on that. Now, if we want to look at this more dynamically, you go, okay, that's great. Well, I can do that in my budget in Excel and I can punch in numbers and I can get, you know, I can do all kinds of things with it. But uh, again, looking at this through the CVP lens, if you will, you'll see how we can do this dynamically. And let me just jump in and show you. So let's just say you're sitting in a meeting or some members bugging you about some dumbass idea. And you know, you want to see, well, what is the effect of doing things uh, from a policy standpoint and a financial standpoint on my bottom line? So I can go in here and just start to say, okay, well, well, we should drop our greens fees by $45. So if I come over here and drop it by $45, boom, all of a sudden, all my graphs dynamically change. And you can see what that does to my bottom line here as well at various volume levels. Let's just say, okay, we're gonna increase our cart fees by 22, boom. Okay, and you know what? We're gonna put in an extra $100,000 into our maintenance budget. So we'll do 1.6 million. And you're noticing as I do this that the chart is changing dynamically and this graph is changing dynamically too. So I can come in here and even change my volume. So let's just say we're anticipating 45,000 rounds. I can change that automatically. Everything is dynamic in nature. So you can see that um, how, much of a handy tool this would be for you to explore various options at your club by just plugging in numbers and instantaneously, this is all changing both in a tabular format, but also dynamically in a graphic format. So um, this can be a very helpful tool in trying to figure out not only what has happened, what is happening, but what's gonna happen or what could happen. Does anybody have any questions on that real quick? All right, one final comment. I think you all know this, but I wanna express it maybe in a, in a different light. One of the things that we are in the golf industry is very uh, capital intensive. They call it, we're highly leveraged, all right? What does that mean? It means that we have a lot of fixed costs. The majority of our costs are fixed in nature. And probably many of you saw this during COVID that when you had an influx of rounds and once you got past the break even point, every bit of revenue goes directly to the bottom line. All of your contribution margin, 100% of it moves directly to the bottom line as opposed to other businesses like a retail store where they have a lot of variable revenues and variable costs, they're not able to accelerate. So if you were to take a look at this example here, uh, you can see, let me just change this back to the 50,000 number. You can see how just a 20% increase in rounds leads to like almost a three, four, hundred percent increase in profitability that's what we call being leveraged so what's my point my point is understanding break even and even if you're at a private club where uh you're you know basically trying to go to zero you can see that just increasing that revenue per round that variable revenue per round can go directly to the bottom line and have a, a an exponential effect on your on your bottom bottom line and or surplus or whatever it is that that you're having to having to deal with so uh, just to review this is cvp it's dynamic you can also put things in here like if you're dealing with memberships you can put in uh membership revenues and then increasing and decreasing the number of members or the or the, the cost of your membership uh, price of your membership and and just build this model out to whatever it is that your particular situation requires so that was our first one. Question? So can I can I ask a quick question? Please. Uh, Matt Oakley here. Uh, one of the things that, that we struggle with here at Worthington is the the thought 
that uh, specifically on the food and beverage side, that more uh, more events, more 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 food and beverage offerings equals greater profit. And I think this model could show you that with fixed costs, that you know t- typically you see that it costs a dollar twenty five for every dollar you bring in. So having a three hundred player event is actually it sounds great to the members, but is not financially feasible. Yeah, and that's exactly the purpose of this. And you could do that in a meeting dynamically, or or just you know send them a report or whatever method you want to use. But yeah, you can go in and just say, okay, well let's let's talk about that. All right, let's just see if we get an extra three hundred people in here. What? Oh, we're actually losing money. So what's the principle of that? Well, that means that basically the club or everybody in the club is subsidizing your party. Is what Correct. We're okay. Mm-hmm. You know, and in bundled community environments where where it's kind of you know everybody's sharing equally in the cost, as you know, you're 24 years in, in one. Everybody thinks that that's such a great idea, and I think this tool could be something you could literally show uh, up on a screen at at a, at a finance committee meeting or a food and beverage meeting or, or a golf committee meeting, and show them, look, every, every dollar we bring in is actually closed as a better answer than than more. Yes, yeah, it, precisely. And again, and you can also play games with this in terms of changing price. You can make it as complex or as simple as you want. And then you can start manipulating the variables in different combinations and permutations. And it's it's more dynamic than just a budget. You know, it, it actually allows you to, you know, make impacts on volume. It's looking at it from a variable cost and a variable revenue point of view rather than your budget is kind of just static. I mean, you can make changes to it, but this will change everything that might impact uh, your variable costs, for example. And uh, so I think it can be a very useful tool, especially in meetings, like you said. Thank you. Joe, Joe, could it also be that you could show that, you know, typically in those types of of operations, we don't charge the members enough, right? We don't don't have the food cost be, we're not running it like Applebee's, where we're, they're gonna they're gonna right size the staffing level for for any given day, and they're gonna right size the the cost of of, of the product. And you, so you can show with those fixed costs that we're not. If we raise the cost of food, we can get we can reverse this trend. Yes. Yeah. You mean raise the price that you charge? Correct. Right. Or reduce the cost? Is that what you're saying, Matt? Yeah, right. You have to either raise the cost of, of yeah. the meal or, or the item. You have to right. raise the cost of the item or decrease the cost. Right. Yeah. And that's that's where you talk about contribution margin. And actually, I want you to hold that thought because you're you're playing right into my hands. So, so I'm going to show a little example of that fact in the F&B area, but you can use it in merchandising as well. I have a little example of that in a minute. So. All right. So let's just uh, keep moving on here. So. Um, now let's drill down and talk a little bit about uh, budget variation analysis. Again, we all live and die with our budget. We're, I'm sure we're all very diligent and we look at it carefully, but there's um, a little bit more to budget variation analysis than we may think. Um, anybody know what are the three components of a variation analysis while I'm here? Let's just talk about a, a, a variable uh, revenue or variable cost. What? What are, does anybody happen to know? What are the? Th- There's three variations in a very vari- a budget analysis. So, in other words, if you have, if you were budgeted for merchandise sales for the month of, uh, I don't know, fifty thousand dollars, and you came in at forty-five thousand, you'd say, well, I had a five thousand dollar negative variation. But there are three elements to that variation. Anybody want to jump in on what those three elements might be? Boy, it's a good thing you're not in my class. I'd have to come after you. But anyway, um, no, it would be, uh, the first would be your volume, okay? You didn't sell enough, okay? Uh, Or maybe you sold more than you thought you would. The other would be the price or cost, the price variation, maybe you discount it too much. And then there's a third one that people don't think about. It's called an assortment variation. In other words, If you're selling more or less of high-end items or lower-end items, you might have hit the volume target, but because of the combination of 
higher end versus lower end things, your total revenue picture didn't match the budget. So the budget is static, but your actual operation is dynamic. So let's take a look at how we can actually uh, analyze a budget variation. So here's an example right here, okay? You need to explain this $1,300 unfavorable sales variation in men's shirts. And so let's just say that you were budgeted for the month for 13,000 in shirts, dollars sold uh, at 175 shirts. So your average sales $75 per shirt, but you actually sold 11,700, 162 and 72. So when we look at the variation, we can see that there's, that's the total variation, which would be on your, you know, your, your financial sheet, your, your budget variation, uh, sheet that I'm sure that the accountant gives you. Uh, then you know that you had 13 less from one of your, you know, information systems, I'm sure that you have, whether it be Jonas or whatever, and that your average sale was $2.30 under the budget. So how do we break this down? Well, in order to determine what um, my price variation was, in other words, how much of the variation, how much of that $1,356 was due to price, I have to take the budgeted volume times the difference between my actual price and the budgeted price. If I do that, that's going to tell me how much of the variation was due to price. I do the same thing with volume. I take my budgeted uh, price and then I take the difference between my actual and budgeted volume and that's going to tell me how much of this variation was due to volume. And then the difference, you can just plug it actually, is always going to be your assortment variations because of the things that I sold. Okay. So it, to look at it uh, more specifically, you can see here that um, in this particular case, when I do the math, I see that of the 1,356, $411 came from the fact that I didn't charge enough. 975 because I didn't sell enough. And then 31 favorable because I actually had a favorable assortment of products. I sold more expensive uh, products than you could see there. And if you were to look at it just graphically, if you wanted to put it up in a chart, you could, you could see how the 1300 is explained away by mostly by volume and obviously by price. Now, we can do the same thing, not only with sales variation, but we can also do it with cost variation as well. So here's an example of F and B. So here we've got uh, the same situation. We were budgeted to have 3,750 in sales at 1,500 beverages, et cetera, et cetera. Actual came in at this, so we can see the variations there. We use the exact same formula. And we find out that the price variation here of 556, 225 came from the fact that we gave discounts. 13 or 313 came from volume, and then the rest was due to price volume or assortment variations. Now, just one quick note: obviously, uh, positive numbers are unfavorable for cost, and positive numbers are favorable for revenue. So. We use the words unfavorable versus pluses and minuses. So this would be a great opportunity for you to be able to you know, more deeply explain um, to you know your boss or whoever uh, or members or golf committee meeting. And I'll just quick story on this. I had a uh, a member uh, that was looking at my budget one time, and we had just killed merchandise. We we blew it out. And uh, we had a lot of favorable and the way that the budget or the the financial statements were given to us. We had the, obviously the revenues on the top, like is normal and the expenses underneath. So you had all this revenue up here and we're looking so good on the revenue side. And then we come down and of course, my cost of sales were were high. And this member kept saying like, well, you guys did really great on the sales, but your your costs are out of control. And I said, uh, no, they're not. And he goes, oh, yes, they are. Look, you got this huge negative cost of sales variation. I go, well, that's because I sold more. I'm going to have more cost of sales. And I went round and round with this person. You can fill in the blank. And, um, you know, finally, I had to do something like this to get them to finally realize you don't understand. It's, it's not just, you know, that I have a negative variation. I sold more, too. And 
So it, it, these can be helpful in for people that really don't understand the nature of variable uh, revenues and variable expenses. So just a little thing here. Now this is gonna just, I just threw this in at the last minute and this goes back to what Matt was saying. Um, one of the things that you can also do in in variation analysis, and this is an example of uh, an f &B analysis called men menu engineering. And essentially what it does, I'm just gonna do this real quick. It actually shows you on your Y axis, you take the uh, contribution margin and on your X axis, you take the amount of volume sold. And here you can see the various items on the menu Think about it for a minute. This is a beautiful little uh, matrix, if you will. It shows here, for example, that prime rib, high contribution margin, high volume. You think that's a winner? Yeah, okay. High contribution margin, low volume. Well, these are something we need to figure out. Uh, we have low contribution, low margin, what are we what are we doing here if we have a, maybe a, a high volume low contribution margin well maybe we're not charging enough so uh this is a neat little grid you can do this this is an f and b example but you can do it for uh merchandise as well you can do it in terms of categories men's shirts women's shirts or you can do it within a category you can get down to the uh vendor and see which vendors nike or who you know whoever we might be dealing with in terms of uh, you know soft goods so uh, the idea here is to uh, strategically understand what are the items that are contributing to my bottom line and which ones are actually detracting from my bottom line especially when we're talking about limited floor space on a merchandising uh, basis um, do we really should we be carrying these things they're actually a drag um, so this is a, an example of uh, that menu engineering, uh, as it's called, or um, in, it's just basically price analysis or costing analysis, if you want to look at it from that point of view. All right. As I mentioned, we would go quick, and now we're going to hit our last topic here, and uh, maybe we'll hit our uh, forecasting as well. But this is uh, uh, basically capital budgeting and the time value of money. But before I do that, just any quick questions on the previous uh, thing that we talked about, the uh, volume price variations? All right, we'll keep chugging. All right, so now we're gonna discuss a little bit about uh, capital expenditures versus revenue expenditures. And these are uh, kind of accounting terms. Uh, capital expenditures are things that we spend money on big ticket items, right? Buildings, uh, equipment, uh, renovations, things that generally are gonna hit the balance sheet and are gonna be depreciated over time. Um, revenue expenditures, when you hear that term, are the things that we kind of put in the income statement and are the things that we spend to just operate our business. They're off the, often operating revenues and operating expenses, the things that you get in your you know, budget for the most part that you, you're held account, you know, accountable for each year. Um, so we're gonna look at specifically these capital expenditures. And sometimes you need to do this, you need to get a, you know, a, a, government regulations, you might need to get a, a you know, better hood or a better refrigeration system in f &B or what have you, uh, can be due to reduce certain operating costs. For example, the longer that you keep equipment, you know, the maintenance cost of that goes up over time. So sometimes it's time for us to retire equipment and, and reduce our, or our maintenance and operating costs. Uh, we may do it to increase sales. Uh, if we want to invest in uh, maybe a nicer pro shop or um, whatever it is that we're trying to do to for the purpose of increasing sales. We want to, uh, maybe we want to replace an existing fixed asset that's just getting old and worn out. Hey, members just want to replace it. It's starting to look a little worn. Uh, expanded to one or more uh, locations, you may want to add something like a fitness center or something along those lines. So these are all reasons for capital expenditures. And I would just say just sometimes for member satisfaction, just to make things look better. Um, 
But one of the things when we're making these large capital outlays, whether it be through a, a loan or whether we're going to fund it internally, is we need to understand that we have to know what the various cash streams are and the effect of time on that cash stream. Now, here's, I think, one of the very and most important things is that right now we are in a time of inflation and interest rates are rising rapidly. Now more than ever is a good time to really take stock of understanding capital budgeting and the time value of money and how we can discount that inflation or those interest rates to see what the effects are in spending money today for, think, for money that will be worth less in the future. So the formula for understanding the future value of money, so in other words, the future value is I have X amount of money today. What is that going to be worth in the future? Well, the formula for determining future value is the present amount times one plus the interest rate to the power of the number of years. Okay, that sounds mind blowing, but it's not. I'll show you how it's done in a minute. So the question is, what will $10,000 be worth in five years with a discount rate of 10%. Well, let's talk about discount rate for a minute. You hear this a lot in the, the capital world. When they're talking about the discount rate, it can be anything that you want. It could be the interest rate from the bank. It could be a rate of return internally that you need to have in order to do a project. It could be inflation. It could be anything that you want. So in this particular example, we're just saying that this uh, club requires a, a rate of return on their money, whether it be through the bank or through an investment or through in, uh, capital expenditures of 10%. So what will $10,000 be worth in five years with a discount rate of 10%? So if we take the formula, which is $10,000 times one plus the interest rate, to the fifth power, that comes out to be $16,105. So you can see that the future value of $10,000 invested today would be worth 16,000 in the future. So I think we get this concept in general. There's a corollary to that called present value. And it essentially works the same way, only in reverse. So suppose you need to have $3,000 in three years to repay a loan and you can set money aside at 5% annually. How much must you set aside to get $3,000 in three years? So using a present value factor of uh, using the 5% and a present value, which you can get from a table or we can do the calculation. I'm gonna show you the calculation in a minute. Um, basically, you need $2,500 uh, and 91 put away today to get $3,000 three years from now. So this is uh, taking what the present value is of $3,000 at 5% to look at it that way, to look at it backwards. So $3,000 three years from now at 5% is worth $2,591 today. So how do we apply all this? And that's the formula. I'll just kind of skip over that. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways in which you can uh, use this capital budgeting model. One way to use it is a very simple way to see what is my return on investment. Now, why do I wanna do this? Well, obviously I wanna see how much money I'm gonna get back, but it also allows me to compare between various options. So if I'm dealing with a capital budget of $100,000, and I have three or four projects on the line, what projects should I do first, if at all, in order to get the returns that I need? Okay, so um, let's just uh, kind of take a look at this. So the models that are out there start from a simple accounting rate of return model and a payback model. Now, these are uh, models that do not include the time value of money. 
More sophisticated models are things like net present value, internal rate of return, and profitability index. So let's just take a look at what these formulas look at look like. So the accounting rate of return formula is the average annual project income, how much I'm going to make on this project, divided by the investment. Simple. The payback period is just the project cost divided by my annual cash flow. Okay, so again, that's a simple kind of formula. I'm going to go through the details of these in a minute. The net present value model is essentially is calculated by subtracting the project cost from the present value of discounted future cash flows and then determining what is my total return on this project. And again, I'm going to go over an example of this in a minute. Um, the advantages to this, obviously, is that it's taken that uh, future value of money into account. There's also another model called the internal rate of return. And this is taking the net present value of cash flows and determining what is the internal rate of return for our investment, discounting for future flows. And again, I think you'll see this uh, as we move forward uh, in a minute. And then there's the profitability index, which is a ratio of the investment to cash flows again, discounted for future and present values. Um, and let me just, best way to do it is to see it. So here's how we can assess uh, different, anybody have any questions or comments? Okay. Um, so here's an example here of a company called Grows Back Golf Club. It always grows back, I guess. So the club's decided to construct forward tees on its 18-hole golf course. Okay, The estimated construction cost is $50,000, and the owner believes that many more rounds will be played and other profit centers will also benefit. So here's their assumptions for 10 years. They're going to increase... Uh, maintenance costs of $5,000, increase green fees of $20,000 a year, increase F&B $2,000, increase miscellaneous uh, sales, shirts, clubs, et cetera, eight grand, and increase the miscellaneous cost of sales and related variable cost of four. So um, if we look at this, um, we see that they have increased greens fees of 20 grand, increase F&B of two, increase merchandise of eight, they have variable cost of four, maintenance of five, so their net cash flows are $21,000 per year. So if we look at this um, and assume a discount rate, so they wanna make sure that they get a 10% return on this investment, that's the discount rate, and they put $50,000 into the project, and this is what they're gonna get over 10 years, What's the payback? Well, if we take the payback period calculation, which is I take my cash flows, my net cash flows, and divide it into the 50,000, I'm going to get my money back in 2.2 years. Simple. Okay, so it's a just a very easy, simple way of looking at what kind of return I'm going to get. So I'm going to basically get my money back in 2.2 years. But it does not take the time value of money into account. The next one is that accounting rate of return, okay, which is simply looking at our total cash flows divided by the investment. So I get a 42% return on my money. So the way to look at that is my 21,000 divided by my 50. It's almost the inverse of the payback. And it says we're going to get $42,000. To determine what my internal rate of return is, and remember, the internal rate of return consists of the cash flows and the time value of money and determines the rate of return earned by the project. So it's looking at the future cash flows discounted for the fact that as we move forward in time, $21,000 five years from now is not worth $21,000 today. Yes? Yes. So it discounts the future cash flows and then determines what is my internal rate of return 
for this investment. So we get 40%. Net present value does the same thing. It takes the future discounted cash flows and subtracts the investment to determine how much money I'm actually making on this given discounted cash flows. And then the profitability index is the ratio of the present value of cash inflows and savings to the present outflows. So it's looking at the inflows versus the outflows and the ratio of this. Okay, why go all through this? Well, we wanna be able to evaluate and ascertain which of many projects is going to provide us with the greatest yield. And given inflation, and given return on investment and discounted money, which project is going to provide me with the greatest amount of return? So we can prioritize projects in, in that way. Now, we use things like the profitability index because, and the net present uh, value because projects can be of varying nature. There are various amounts of money. They have a, a varying amount of uh, return on investment, that the time horizons are different. So looking at things like the profitability index takes all of that into account and puts them on a relative uh, playing field. So we're just about five minutes out from our hour. So we covered the three topics uh, that I wanted to hit, and maybe now we can open it up to, to questions. And um, uh, see if uh, anybody has anything they'd like to address at this time. So let me close this out. Anybody, any uh, questions? Joe, Joe, I've got a question, Matt Oakley oh. here. Sorry to jump in. Yeah. I think the typical pro has uh, is responsible for two types of financial responsibility to their to their uppers. One is to present a budget or, or a prediction of the future. What, what are we going to do next year? And then two, explain the variances on a monthly basis. What would you suggest to us for uh, first on the budget side of of what variant? You know, what 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 types of, of factors should we be thinking of why 2024 is going to be different than 2023 actions? Man, I got to tell you, I should. I, it's like you said. I should just sent you the questions. I mean, that uh, uh, my final thought on this was about actually forecasting, and one of the ways that uh, I think you can be effective in the, to your first question, putting together that budget, is to have more robust and just oh, this is what we did last year, and okay, uh, yeah, we'll just uh, that'll be the same. You know, line by oh, this I think will go up. 2%, that, 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 that. but to actually have uh, forecast models uh, that you can use to predict the future. And I just, um, well, I can show you an example of that, Matt, real quick. Um, let me just go back and try to bring that screen up. I just closed it. Uh, do, do, do. It might take a second here. Well, anyway, while this is loading, um, the idea is to uh, be able to use more sophisticated models in terms of forecasting the future. And let me see if this comes up now. Are you all seeing this coming up, by the way? Yes. Okay. Yep. All right, good. Well, here's an example of a forecast model. Okay, like you said, you know, how do we budget? How do we plan for the future? And this is an example of a forecast model, all right? So great question. When do we renovate? Well, this is an example of a forecast model uh, that is using two variables to predict the future. This bar line is reciprocal revenue this line is the members you know outside reciprocals this top line here is the uh survey results for 
member satisfaction on the condition of the golf course. Y'all see a pattern here? Oh, the course looks great. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. So you have this argument going back and forth. But this is data driven. This is a data driven decision. So I was able to run a regression analysis. And by the way, there's uh, also a video on this uh, that uh, Jackie's attaching uh, to show you how to do uh, some modeling. But this is a regression that that took the member satisfaction and projected into the future and it was absolutely on so basically i was able to go before the board and say look what the reciprocals are telling you with your feet and the members are telling you with their surveys is that this place is going downhill and it's going to continue that way now i did this over in this time frame and this model you can see here the r squared which is the correlation analysis was 90 almost 97 percent so it was highly accurate and guess what the next year it came out exactly that so this is an example how you can use the modeling not only for making larger decisions like that but you can use the model for forecasting uh future events uh that that are happening you can put in things like um, one of the models i did was i was able to correlate the exchange rate of the canadian dollar we had a lot of Canadians at the club and I was able to forecast how much revenue I could get from them. And we, I found that there was a direct correlation between the exchange rate of the Canadian dollar, and the US dollar and how much they spent. They were a big chunk of our revenue picture. So I was able to forecast what that was going to be before it happened and build it into the budget. So I don't I hope that answered your question, Matt. Absolutely, yes. I think what I learned from you today is that one of the things I want to use is that model to, to present maybe more than one variation of a budget. For example, here, here's what it would be at, cur at, at current car fee or current guest fee and, and predicting the future of, of you know 2% increase in rounds. Here's what we think is going to happen. But here's what would happen if we raise the car fee $2 and the guest fee $5. And show that very that graph pivoting. That's really cool. I think I think that's visual would be something that would be helpful to a board. Yeah, and then the second part about your um, variation, uh, you know, analysis. Uh, I think to have a lot of uh, KPIs is really important. Uh, so you just go beyond uh, the static variation. But what's behind that? What am I looking at in terms of? Um, uh, hours and hours per round, you know, work hours per round, all different kinds of KPI. I have a whole separate thing on that. I won't get into that now. Um, but uh, any other questions? I think somebody else tried to get in with a question. Joe, I think one of the questions that uh, they were asking was, is would you be able to furnish those files to us after? Yeah, uh, as uh, um, I mentioned, uh, Jackie's going to send you a link that has um, the step by step on how to construct. Uh, I don't, well, I could, I could probably get the files too, so you could play with it. But the, um, the those uh, YouTube videos will actually step you through how to do the, the process, which may be better if you use your own data, but. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I can do that. It's a big deal. Great. Um, thank you. Anybody else? Um, okay. One final thing. I just want to wrap it up with this. Okay. So uh, the idea here is that we need to get more sophisticated tools in our chest so that we can add value to our membership and, and to our profession. Um, and what I talk about, especially as you start to gain more of these kinds of things, um, it gets you out of those golf committee meetings that I call high school student council meetings, okay? Well, I think the prom color should be this. Everybody's got an opinion about all kinds of dumbass things. And when you can come armed with things like the CVP, the variation analysis, or capital budgeting, you know, because, oh, we really want to get in a new flower garden. Well, okay, but, you know, well, or should we redo the teaser? We should, you know... Maybe we need the air access, whatever it happens to be. The idea is that now you're coming armed with 
real data-driven decisions, not just what I call high school student council, just because they think it's a good idea. And that I think can really help add value to your, to your position. Um, so future things that I would say, if you wanted to, you know, think about looking into some KPIs, you know, think about looking into uh, some more data analytics to get underneath the hood of, of your operation. And think about even things like uh, artificial intelligence and how we're going to now integrate that into our profession. So that's my final comment. I hope you found it valuable. I'll just one more final time. Any questions, anybody? Comments? Joe, thank you for your service. Thanks for this. Uh, and thanks for, for everything you do. I appreciate it. Y'all have a great day. Go rock thank the world. Thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. And as he mentioned, I will be following up with an email with a with a couple different resources for you all. So um, appreciate it, Joe. And um, hopefully there's a lot of good stuff there to take away. Thank Thanks, you. Joe. And uh, Jack, thank you. And Jackie, maybe I can get you those uh, files too. I'll, I'll email you some of the um, worksheets. Yeah, that'd be great. I'll, I'll wait for you to do that before I send it out to everyone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That was great. Appreciate it. I really enjoyed it, Joe. Thank you. Thanks, Daryl. William. Thank you.